It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life brings you interviews with some of the most inspirational and influential people in the world. It's our goal to educate and empower you so you can live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. We have another great show for you today. Does your family suffer from affluenza exhaustion? Are you confused by the me, me, me attitude of your child? Whether your children are 6, 16, or 36, it may be time for an entitlement intervention. Today's guest, Dr. Michael Wetter, explains how we can create a family culture where responsibilities are honored, praise has meaning, and gratitude is second nature. Dr. Wetter is an author and nationally recognized behavioral health expert. His new book is Earn It, What to Do When Your Kid Needs an Entitlement intervention. Welcome, Dr. Wetter. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So, Doctor, it feels like we are living in a society of entitled individuals. How it does, doesn't ha- it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How did this happen? What has occurred from the time I was a child in the 70s until now? Well, you know, I'm also a child in the 70s, so I think we're a product. Um, you know, I, I think what happened was when, when you look at historically, you had a culture and, and the, the generation of the baby boomers where everything was invested so much in the work ethic and the, and the, the goal of which was to essentially produce so that you have some form of security, produce meaning earn an income. And that, that was a product of the Depression. That was a product of the wartime era. Mm-hmm. And so much emphasis then was placed on working, earning, and producing. But I think when it came to the 70s, there was a sort of shift in the emphasis to we need to focus more on nurturing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like the, the pendulum culture that we are, we don't go to the middle, we go to the extreme. Right. And I think where that tended us to go is that's where you get those participation awards. Hey, it's not that you did a great job in playing baseball. It's that you showed up to play baseball. Right. So we're, right. so we're going to give you a trophy. And I think that sort of perpetuated as, as time went on to become this thing of I am now entitled to the recognition uh, that I think I deserve because I showed up to play. Mm-hmm. whether that be at work or, or anywhere else. And in doing that, because I, I know that's such a hot topic, that was a great example, because I raised two boys who did play sports, and and I always felt that we weren't getting them ready for life because they never learned how to manage disappointment. Correct. And I think, you know, one of the most important lessons we can teach our kids, easier at a young age, but certainly at any age, is a successful way to deal with failure, a successful way to deal with disappointment when things don't go your way how do you recover and what that essentially builds is such a key component of human behavior which is resiliency we need resiliency in the face of adversity we need resiliency in order to power on and when we don't have opportunities for successful failure and to learn from those mistakes children lose the ability to develop and build resiliency Doctor, how much of an impact do parents have on children, and how much does society influence their behavior? Because I always see parents kind of raising their hands saying, I don't know what else to do. I've done everything I can think of. Parents have 150%. Parents have to be the filter through which society's influence passes through. Mm -hmm. We are guardians of our children. And as as parents, myself, you know, I I, I lump myself into this. I have a uh, a beautiful daughter, uh, Leah, who's, who's eight and a half years old. And trust me when I say, whether it's a television show, a YouTube channel, a book, a comic, whatever it may be, a video game, it has to pass the daddy test first before it goes on to Leah. Do you think it's time that parents take back their homes? I think parents should never have relinquished them. <laughs> so the answer to the question is yes. Remember, you know, the role of a parent is not to be your child's best friend. Right. They will develop best friends over the course of their life, and those best friends will change over time. You are the parent, and your job as the parent is not to be their best friend and 
not to fall into the trap that I believe we all make, which is the desire to always keep our kids happy. When we try to make our kids happy all the time, we step out of that role as parent. We step out of that objective protector, that filter. And instead now, we're trying to do whatever we can to keep that smile on their face. Well, going with that thought, doctor, with one Mm -hmm. in two marriages ending in divorce and both parents working and working long hours, do you think it's what's happening within our relationships and our society that is causing parents to want to keep their children happy, to make up for what they believe is a loss? Oh, I think there's absolutely a compensation factor going on, without question. And I think what we have to recognize is what's the long-term outlook? You know, what are we thinking about long terms of the impact it's going to have on the kids and their their long-term development? You know, the short-term happiness may lead and result in a longer-term, let's just call it dysfunction, the inability to bear distress. And I think what they feel is by whether it be the divorce rate or not being home as much or being out and their children are spending time with a nanny or being shuffled from place to place in daycare and grandparents, that's the time to step back and sort of reassess. Reassess one, what are the priorities? Reassess number two, what can I do as a parent not to make sure that my child is always happy, to make sure that my child is stable and has solid, solid relationship with me for whatever time they have with me. Okay, so understanding the situation and the importance, what do we do? What do you say to that parent who raises up his or her hand and says, I- I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to do here. At that point, what I would ask is, what have you done thus far? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's take an inventory. Let's look at what you've done. And rather than looking at it from a judgmental standpoint of what's good and what's bad, let's look, look at what's been effective. And I think if you know, we can take that standpoint, right away we eliminate that, that uh, rule of judgment that so often hangs so heavy over many parents. I'm not a good parent. I'm not, a, I'm not doing a great job. I'm not a good mother. I'm not a good father. That's not about that. How effective have you been? And then, again, we take a step back and we say, what is it that you want for your child? What's the goal? What is it that you want to accomplish? Now, now that we have a goal, now that we have an end point, how do we assess and how do we plan to achieve that goal? What behaviors do we need to do? If we're talking about your child having a more um, uh, a higher appreciation for the things they have and having a more uh, open attitude towards gratitude, what words are we using every day that model for our children uh, gratitude and acceptance? So, for example, a very simple one. It's very easy to say, come on, wake up. I've got to get going. I have to go to work. Versus saying, come on, let's go, we have to get ready. Today I get to go to work, and I need to get going so I'm not late. Same thing gets modeled with the children. You know, some days my daughter goes up, oh, why do I have to go to school? And I'll say, you don't have to go to school. In fact, we'll take you out of school. You never have to go to school again, but then you'll never go to school. And she'll go, oh, no, 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 I want to go. I said, then you get to go to school because there's many people in this world that would give their left and right arm both to be able to go to school to be able to learn, to be able to be with their friends, to be in a nurturing environment. So let's appreciate the fact that you have this opportunity. The only thing you have to do is get up and to reframe that attitude, reframe the words we use. Remember, we model for our children, and they reflect back to us what we are modeling. Doctor, what is the difference between someone having self-confidence and someone who's entitled? Ah, That's a great question. (laughs) <laughs> and it's one that I'm struggling to answer each and every day at times. Uh-huh. You know, I, I think that self-confidence is the ability to face adversity and take responsibility for what you're doing to earn that achievement. I think self-confidence is the knowledge that whatever may come, you are going to continue to work to push forward, and you're going to make that difference on your own. Whereas entitlement is externalizing the blame, externalizing the work. You know, I shouldn't have to do this to earn this. I shouldn't have to work as hard. The reason why I failed is X, Y, and Z because of those people, not because of what I did. And I think fundamentally that is the boundary and that is the distinction between uh, self-confidence and entitlement. What happens in a person's life when he or she feels entitled? What impact does it have? Well, I, I think that you have to, we have to look at the context and we have to look at the person. But ultimately, when there's an overdeveloped sense of entitlement, I think one of the consequences is the inability to function autonomously, independently, and deal with whatever life throws your way. It's going to impact your social relationships because if you continuously externalize the blame, people aren't going to want to associate with you. 
it impacts your ability to weather the storm. Because when life throws you a curveball, which it will do, it's not a question of if, Mm -hmm. it will, will you be able to endure it in such a way where you don't decompensate and fall apart? And also, it gets back to this notion of earning it, earning the opportunities that come your way and, and, and the joy and the pride that comes with knowing that you worked hard to earn what you have achieved. And I think children and young adults who have developed an overdeveloped sense of entitlement are robbed of that joy of earning something and achievement. Now, Doctor, we've been talking about children and parents, but what about adults? And and you're going to probably look at me. I have some issues whenever I get in my car and I drive. But one of the things that really drives me crazy, and I don't know if this is a national law for something just here in New Jersey, but we have this thing now where people that are walking in the crosswalks no longer have to stop, look both ways. They now have the right of way. So you can be driving your car, and all of a sudden people who aren't even paying attention just feel entitled to walk in front of your car and it's your responsibility to stop. Every time I see that, it drives me crazy because I think it's something so small, but I think it now gets carried into their life in different ways. People no longer stop, and again, here are my traffic examples, but they don't stop at yield signs. Coming onto a highway, they have the right of way. Forget about the car doing 60 coming up the road. They don't stop at red lights. It's like that light is not for them. How do we as adults manage being around people that feel entitled? And how can we help those people understand that the world does not revolve around them? Well, you've just described a very European way of driving. <laughs> every time you, you step onto the sidewalk, you take your life into your hand. And every time you step into a car, you know, uh, you, you well, it's take New your Jersey life now. <laughs> now. Now it's New Jersey, you know. Um, you know, I really do think that, first of all, People who don't seek help won't accept help. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure how much we can affect change in those who aren't looking to change. That being said, I think one of the things that we need to continuously advocate for is that we are not a self-centered world, that there is a mutual accountability. And I'm going to be a bit of a broken record and go back to my original point, which is it all starts in the home. Now, you can do it later. You could have conversations later. But when is it easier to learn to play a piano, when you're seven or when you're 57? The lessons that are learned early on get ingrained and become part of the neural pathways, become part of our character. Uh, As we get older, we can still make changes, but they become more compensatory in nature versus intrinsic. I really believe that the way we start ha- you know, making those changes is bringing to light the, the subject matter of entitlement. I mean, look at our – I love your traffic example, and, and you can, you know, we can extrapolate that to our current climate, both in politics and, mm-hmm. and news and, and, and entertainment. Look at the abuses of, of power that comes hand-in-hand hand with entitlement, the, mm-hmm. the entitlement of believing that I can do whatever I want. I can hurt or take advantage of whoever I want because I'm untouchable. And I'm going to use, I'm going to wield my power like a weapon against those who I just want to use. That didn't start when somebody was 40. That started earlier on when they were four. That was based on those experiences. And I think what we really need to do is look at ourselves. Again, how are we interacting? So if if I'm the driver in your scenario, the first step is to, to not to say, oh, my God, the pedestrian doesn't have the right of way. I have the right of way. I got the car. But to say, we both have a right of way here. We both have to be cautious. How do we communicate that? How do we communicate that to our lawmakers? That, you know what, someone who can't just step off the curb and think that everybody's going to stop because if I stop suddenly because someone steps off the curb, I'm going to get rear-ended. And now it sets off a whole chain reaction. So where is the mutual accountability? And I think that's really kind of at the heart of the matter. It's not about them versus me or me versus them. It's it's the we. And I think sometimes in our society, we focus on the me and we forget the we. The book is Earn It, What to Do When Your Kid Needs an Entitlement Intervention by Dr. Michael Wetter. If you would like to get more information about the book or Dr. Wetter and his work, you can visit drwetter.com. That's D-R-W-E-T-T-E-R, drwetter.com. Doctor, in our final moments, what's the takeaway? What do you want to leave our listeners with? Well, you know, the, 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 it's a great question, and again, thank you for the opportunity. I, I think the takeaway from this is we need to take a step back from worrying so much or focusing so much on the moment and focus on the long term. Look at how our actions right now 
will have an impact down the line. And I think that sometimes gets missed. I think we focus so much on making our children and ourselves happy in the moment that we forget about the long-term consequences and repercussions that come with it. So the real takeaway I would recommend is whether you're a parent or whether you're a young adult or even an older adult, look at how your behaviors will influence your children's development longer term. What kind of people do you really want them to be? How are you working with them to build resiliency? And how are you modeling for them the capacity to become self-sufficient, weather the storm, and appreciative of what life has to offer? Dr. Wetter, thank you so much for joining us today. This really is such an important topic. So thank you for reminding us of how everything starts in the home, how parents need to understand that we are role models for our children, we should take advantage of teachable moments, and that we all need to look for mutual benefits. I think if we spend more time doing that, we can definitely improve the quality of our life and the future generations. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided are the opinions of our guests and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read our digital magazine, take part in the book club, check out our team, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.